Okay, so this is our question. Following up on our conversation yesterday, we said 1790, reasonable population of deer. 1900, no deer. 1909, extirpated. And now we've got more deer than we ever did. Why? So give me one reason. Skylar, go ahead. No natural predators. No natural predators. Okay, who's got another one? Austin. Less people require deer as a food source. Okay, fewer human hunters. Or I guess less reliance on venison. Okay, you got one, Lucian? Smaller bag limits. Okay, smaller bag limits. Well, remember, like 1850s, 1860s, there were no bag limits, so it's not smaller versus larger, but okay. Uh, a lot of cover in wooded areas. Ooh, cover in wooded areas. I haven't heard anything from you guys. What you got? People don't hunt like they used to. Okay, fewer hunters. I didn't hear anything from you guys. Like, fewer, I, hunters. fewer hunters. That's the only thing you have? I have the bag of it. Okay, have you mostly gotten things? Do you have something that's not on the list yet? No, I have a question. Okay. You want us to turn our thing? Okay, so we've got no natural predators, fewer human hunters, less reliance on venison, um, lower bag limits, cover wooded. That's cover wooded areas. Um, fewer hunters again. Is there anything that you feel we should knock off, combine? Is there anything you feel like we missed? I mean, I think by this point with just the small number of people, yeah? I mean, like, the only thing killing them is, like, fires and things like that. Just, uh, okay, so the only, the only real, like, population size pressures on them, um, not a lot of dead deer. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the other class wrote, um, not much dying, lots of being born. Okay. <laughs> That's not unreasonable. <sighs> okay. So, here, here are some answers. And there are more. And things like, um, you know, disease pressure versus human, you know, total reliance on, on wild food sources... One of the big ones is that habitat in Ohio is really good for deer at this point. Um, deer love, and those of you who hunt know, they love mixed habitat. They love shrub and scrub and woods edge. They love a mixture of cornfields and forests. Um, deep, big woods aren't great habitat for deer, honestly. And totally open country, like out on the plains, that's not good habitat for deer. What we have here is pretty ideal for deer. It's a mixed environment. And I like, this is my little poetic bit, because, you know, I have to wax philosophical every now and then. Um, I like to think of deer as creatures of the edge. You could write a poem about this if you want later. The edge of night, the edge of morning, the wood's edge. So, because remember, they're crepuscular. <laughs> they're dawn active. They're dusk active. They're edge dwellers. They, they like those kind of, like, changing uncertain conditions. Um, so that's the, the environment here. And somebody said, you know, cover wooded areas, good mix of habitat types. That's good for deer. The other big thing is that the natural predators of the white tail were also extirpated. And who is, who is this lovely creature? That is a wolf. That is a wolf. That is a darn wolf. And we used to have them in Ohio. We had them in Ohio. And we're going to take a little sidebar trip because there's something we didn't get to talk <coughs> about when we did um, the, the tail end of the evolution stuff that I want to talk about now because it comes up in regards to wolves. So we do not have wolves in Ohio anymore, and let's draw some pictures. So this is North America. We just established that. And prior to, I'm not sure where exactly that line should be, but prior to European colonization, this entire thing was the home range for a species that we will refer to as Canis lupus. You know what that is? 
that's the wolf. Wolves. So a couple of things that we haven't talked about much yet. This is a genus name. This is a species name. This is kind of like your family name, your last name, and your first name. So in this case, this is the genus. And this connects wolves to other canids. So there are several canis species. Lupus is the name that individually refers to one species. So that's the species name. So Canis lupus was found all over North America. Um, there were little Mexican red wolves. There were timber wolves and gray wolves up north. Um, and there was one other canid species in North America. Huh? No. Those are all, those are all Canis lupus. Those are all Canis lupus. There was another canid species in North America, and they lived... Mostly about there. Much smaller range, and also a much smaller canid. And this species was Canis, was, is, Canis latrans. Coyotes. Coyotes, the singing dogs. And I lived out west for a while. I moved out to Arizona when I was 19 and lived there for about a year and a half because I needed a place to go when I dropped out of college. Um, <laughs> I needed an adventure, so off I went. Um, and I, I saw coyotes in the desert, and I hadn't really seen a whole lot of coyotes here. Um, when I was a kid, we didn't have a whole lot of coyotes in this area. They've become much more abundant in the last 20 years. Um, and, yeah, I should write in that that's coyotes. Um, those little western coyotes are cute. <laughs> now, they'll eat your cat. The first thing I, people told me when I moved to Tucson was, oh, do you like your house cat? Yes. Keep her inside. The coyotes like to eat cats. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll do that. And they're little. They're like a big male would be like 30 pounds. They're like a little knee-high dog, and they're skinny little things. They're not, they're, they're little, and they're scrawny, and they're pretty. Um, and I remember seeing them out in the desert at night. We're going to talk about that. So we had coyotes in the west and in the plains, and we had Canis lupus, the wolf, pretty much everywhere. With some regional variation in wolves, we had, you know, what they call timber wolves in Minnesota. We had Arctic wolves in Alaska, but they were all the same species, some a little bigger, some a little lighter, some a little darker, just regional variation. And then came European Americans, European settlers at that time, and what did we do with the wolves? Killed them all! <laughs> Killed them all. So what we end up with, and this is a, a really squishy little map, is some pockets of wolves, certainly here, um, probably not even so much there, certainly up here. Um, I think there were some remnant pockets like here and here. So we replaced that big, wide-ranging wolf range with some little isolated pockets of wolves. And we'll talk, as we get into ecology more, we'll talk about niche, um, an organism's niche, and the fact that it's like a job to be done. And wolves had a job to do. They were predators. So um, we got rid of the wolves, and a funny thing happened on the way to extinction. So with no wolves around, Anybody have to compete with an older sibling or an older cousin for resources at home, like pizza or cookies or bed space or couch space during movies? Okay. So when they get up to go to the bathroom, you're watching a movie on the couch, there's one bowl of popcorn, there's one blanket, there's one couch, they get up to go to the bathroom, what do you do? Take it. Spread it out! <laughs> exactly. Take it. Move your meat, lose your seat. Sorry. I got the good spot on the couch. Ah! Well, when coyotes were eliminated from a large portion of the U.S., I'm sorry, when wolves were eliminated from a large portion of the U.S., coyotes started to expand their range. So we saw coyotes, especially for some reason, expanding northward. And you can look up exact details on this. I'm probably getting some of the details wrong. That's okay. The big picture piece is that this matters a lot. Okay. That's actually um, northern U.S., southern Canada. There's a place called Algonquin National Park in Ontario. We'll talk about that in a second. But let me ask you this. 
what makes a species? How is Canis latrans different from Canis lupus? How can you tell that these two things, one of these things, is not like the other? What's different? Size difference. There's a size difference. Western coyotes are little scrubby things. Eastern, eastern gray wolves, Canis lupus, they're big animals. Um, Western coyotes, a, a big male might be lucky to go 35 pounds, might be a record male. Um, in the old Canis lupus, if we look at timber wolves and gray wolves and arctic wolves, we're talking about animals that can go 100 to 175 pounds for an adult male. That's a lot of dog. They're tall, they're big, they're much larger animals. There are also, if you happen to have a coyote skull next to a wolf skull, you would see differences in some of the attachment points for the muscles. Those are all differences in shape or form. What's that word? Oh, what is that word? We keep, it keeps coming up. And it means morph. This is the old morphological definition of species. They're shaped different. Oh. Because up to a certain point, the only thing humans could do is look at two animals and say, yep, they don't look alike. They must be different species. Who here has gone fishing and caught a bluegill? Okay. Feisty little suckers, aren't they? Um, have you ever caught a sunfish that wasn't a bluegill? Some people call them pumpkin seeds. Okay. What's the difference between a pumpkin seed and a bluegill? Some, some minor differences in color. My dad used to always say, look at the ear flap. If the ear flap's all black, that's a bluegill. Though generally he'd just go, yeah, it's some kind of sunfish. <laughs> They're pretty closely related. They look a little different. They're, they're not that different in size. But you know what happens? See, I need a recording I can cue up. You know what happens if you take a bluegill and a little sunfish and you put them in a tank and you light some candles and you play the Barry White? Well, they don't actually bang as in have sexual intercourse, but they will exchange genetic material, sure enough, he will make a beautiful little nest. She will go, yeah, fine, I'll squirt my eggs in there, whatever. And he'll squirt sperm all over it. So, yes, the colloquial expression typically refers to the act of intercourse, and fish don't do that. They just sort of leave their stuff laying around, and it all gets fertilized. Um, they're capable of interbreeding. They can have babies. I'm not sure if their babies can have babies. So, there was... <laughs> There, there are some, has anybody gone walleye fishing? I've been on the other end of walleye fishing. Have I told you about squeezing walleye for eggs and sperm yet? Oh, it, was it was a summer job one year. It was fantastic. Um, Division of Wildlife takes sauger, which are a game fish, and they take walleye, which are a game fish, and they mix walleye eggs with sauger sperm, and they get saw guys. It's a hybrid species. So you got saw guys, but can saw guys have babies? So this cuts us to the second definition of species. So the first definition that we always use, the old definition of species was morphological. Do they look alike? The second was babies. Actually, it's really grandbabies. Can their babies have babies? So I am thinking, this is, this is a game, it's like one of those guess my, what I'm thinking games. Oh, I love these. Okay, this is good. This is a good party game. You can use this at your next party. Um, I'm thinking of a farm animal. Do not yell it out. I will kick you in the shins if you yell it out. I'm thinking of a farm animal, and that would hurt, um, that has parents of two different species. Commonly found. I've seen them in Columbiana County, Ohio. You know it. Don't say it yet. Who thinks they know it? Farm animal, parents of two different species. Okay. Oh, right on the tip of your brain. Does anybody thinking, let's say it all together. One, two, three. Cow. Mule. <laughs> no, bulls and cows are the same species. And if well, you I haven't had think, that talk yet. I know, the, I know the bulls and cows are the same species, but let's take it like... Different types of Those are different like, varieties. Like, Those are different breeds. That's like oh, okay. that's like breeding a collie to a German Shepherd. They're all well, dogs. Excuse me, yesterday because oh, you said mule. 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 Yeah. mule. Horse and a donkey. Mule. 
Now I just like saying, no! Horse. Darn it! Okay, a horse and a donkey. Did you guys have that? I thought you did. Wait, so you have mules? So, why do... So, no, horses are one species, donkeys are another species. You put a horse and a donkey in a barn together, you light some candles, you play some Barry White, and boom, you got a mule. I'm so glad you guys get the Barry White joke, because fifth period didn't get it. I had to explain it to them, and that takes all the joy out of it. So okay. Mules? Anyway. Um, so anyway. Like mules and other mules? You! Should I pay you a quarter an hour later? That's exactly the question I wanted to ask. What do you finish your question? What's your question? So can mules and other mules like Can they do it? Yeah. They can do it. Can they have a baby is the question. Well they can do it all they want. Maybe. They can do it all they want. Can they have a baby? That's the question. That's the question. And the answer is no. Why? They're sterile They're hybrids. They are a hybrid species. They're a hybrid. And the second test for species has always historically been fertile offspring. <coughs> so you can, you can breed mules to mules to mules. You're not going to get baby mules. We get new mules by breeding a horse to a donkey, a horse to a donkey, a horse to a donkey, a horse to a donkey. We put two mules together. Like I said, play Barry White all you want. You're not going to get baby mules out of the thing. There have been cases where mules have been bred back to horses, and they sometimes get babies out of that. But it's even then, it's pretty low fertility, like maybe half the time a baby comes out of it, where, you know, put a horse and a horse together, you breed them, you're going to get babies. Um, so this fertile offspring thing is important. Where am I going? Where is Moser going with this? She's crazy, and she's talking about mules. Good Lord. Where, who's in charge of keeping her on track today? No, I'm on track. You need more coffee. Oh, coffee. So the third definition we've always used for species, well, not always, the third definition we use for species is pretty new. What's something we've only been able to do in the last 30 or 40 years to identify individuals? Look it up. DNA. Jerry Springer, man. Jerry Springer. Who's your daddy? We can look at the DNA for a group of organisms and say, well, if they share more than 99.999% of DNA and they all have this gene, they are the same species. So it's a three-pronged definition. We look, at, we look at their morphology. Do they look like the same animal? Can they have babies? And is their DNA pretty close? OK. Why am I telling you all this? Because up here, we had coyotes and we had wolves in Algonquin National Park. And somebody put on the Barry White. Oh, no. Well, actually, what it really comes down to is that there were very small groups, very small groups of each species, and there was a lot of pressure on them. And they end up interbreeding. And so what has mostly populated the eastern wow, U.S. Foxes are no, foxes are their own species. Um, but the eastern coyote that some of us have seen is actually a hybrid of wolves and coyotes, but they are a fertile hybrid. Wolves and coyotes are closely enough related, and there was enough interbreeding over the time. And if you look up the species name for the eastern coyote, you'll see that they call it Canis lupus x latrans, because what they have figured out is that when you look at the DNA for the eastern coyote, it's got a lot of wolf DNA in it. It's clearly a coyote. It's not a wolf, but it's a wolfier coyote. They are bigger. So, uh, you know, I said a big west eastern, big western coyote might go 30 pounds. You know, that's a knee-high dog. Our eastern coyotes, a big male can go 65 pounds. It's about twice the size. Um, now, there's still, and you can look up data on coyote human attacks, you know, not a big concern. But what we have here is this cool, interesting species. So we did get rid of the wolf. And move your meat, lose your seat. Coyotes, the eastern coyotes, the, the koi wolf, the Canis latrans, cross lupus, whatever you want to call it, moved in. Biologists had always said, well, coyotes aren't going to pick up hunting deer. 
they're too small. Plus, there's one serious difference between coyotes and wolves. Wolves hunt in very, very large packs. They tend to hunt in very large groups. Coyotes, so this is like if you imagine living in a house with all your aunts and all your uncles and all your cousins, it's a large family group. That pack is a very large family group. Coyotes tend to be nuclear family only. Mom, dad, three kids. They tend to be much smaller family groups. So they don't have that kind of size advantage for taking down larger prey. I'm going to show you a video. So I'm going to stop this recording, show you a video, and then we're going to come back because we've got to talk about our next species. <laughs>